Welcome back students. Well, in this video, let's talk about uh, nuclear uh, force in a little more detail. I want to give some inputs about that. And, uh, and after that, we'll talk about nuclear fission and fusion. Uh, this will uh, complete uh, this lesson. So we'll do that now. So let me talk about the nuclear force. We said the nuclear force, the nuclear force exists This exists between um, the nucleons, right? Uh, there can be a force between uh, neutron and neutron, and neutron and proton, and also between proton and proton. Okay, so it's this will have uh, no neutron neutron combination, and then neutron proton, and uh, and proton and proton. But this force, this the force between proton and proton, you know, uh, will be much larger than the electrostatic force of repulsion between them. But then, if uh, the uh, if the nuclear force is so much, then why are proton and proton not getting attracted in the normal situations? Uh, that is because this nuclear force is a very short range force, right? Okay, it, it, a nuclear force is a short range force. It exists over a very, very, very uh, small uh, distance in, in femtometers, 10 power minus 15 meters, something like that. So it, 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 uh, it's a very short range force. Uh, beyond that short range, it that's kind of like ceases to exist. Okay? It becomes quickly uh, zero beyond a short range. That is why if you take a proton here and if you keep a proton here, it's so definitely you're going to have electrostatic force repulsion but not the nuclear force of attraction. The reason is because at this distance, nuclear force will not even take place. But then if, they, if you bring them together, 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 uh, you know, closer and closer and closer, I should say, uh, at a very short distance, uh, in, in femtometers, then that the nuclear force will take over, it will start attracting. It will be much greater than the electrostatic force of repulsion, so they will combine. Okay, so that is, uh, itself is a very short range force and that is why you you find proton proton repulsion at you know uh, at normal distances and uh, proton proton attraction when you know when the when, when becomes uh, when the distance becomes very 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 small okay? but then this attraction does not take place forever okay for any short distance uh, so the nuclear force is uh, is like your uh, the, the molecular uh, force of attraction. You remember when you bring two molecules together, two atoms together, when they form a molecule, okay, uh, they get attracted. Okay? Uh, when you take two atoms, for example, oxygen O2, then you have one oxygen atom and another oxygen atom. When you bring them to the atom itself, I'm not talking about nucleus now. When you bring them together, uh, then they'll start attracting. And then they combine, but when they come closer, then there is this force of repulsion that takes place there. Right? You have seen that graph uh, in your 11th standard in chemistry, and the same thing happens here too. Okay. Uh, so what happens is the graph is something like this. So this is a distance between the nucleons, and there's a very short range is zero. Okay, I'll say this is zero potential energy. Obviously, when you have a force of attraction, okay, uh, then you are a repulsion, you, you will have potential energy associated with it, right? So either you, uh, you, you, you don't allow, you can do work against it. So if you can do work against the force, then there will be a potential energy. That's what I mean. Uh, so the potential energy, if we, we do the potential energy of the nuclear force, the nuclear force is like this. Very quickly, within femtometers, okay, maybe like, like you just uh, this is one femtometer, let's say this is two femtometers. Very quickly, beyond 1.5 femtometers, so it will become nothing, okay. It will almost equal to zero. There is no oh, potential energy. It's like 
the one or two femtom the, the two femtometers itself will become uh, infinity for it like the distance infinity okay so even if you take it beyond that uh two femtometers then your this is, this force is not even acting on it acting on the nucleon so uh beyond say two femtometers i'll say this is two femtometers between power minus 15 okay beyond this it's almost zero then when you bring it here then then you see then the potential energy becomes negative because it's attractive force right because in attractive force the potential energy is negative you have seen that in the lesson gravitation uh, and even in uh, electrostatics if you have uh, a negative charge then the potential will be negative as you bring closer and closer it will become more and more negative you know because you need to apply the brakes it is getting attracted so you have to apply the brakes right so as you bring closer then it becomes more and more negative so the force is attractive then you will have negative potential energy okay. so you, you, you come here it comes down comes down comes down and let's see okay. now at about 0.8 this is one step, about 0.8 femtometers 0.8 femtometer then it reaches its minimum potential okay and if you bring it closer than that 0.8 femtometer then what happens is repulsion takes place now first it is attracting so it's attracting till 0.8 femtometer you have you understand it clearly so beyond say 1.52 femtometers it's the nuclear force doesn't even exist so it is for the potential energy is zero here no force no energy it's uh, close to zero here okay but then you bring it closer and closer and closer then it, it starts attracting the nuclear you know the nuclear force is becoming dominant so it starts at, attracting as it attracts then you have to do work against it right you, you should not allow this to accelerate so doing work against it so the potential becomes negative 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 so it keeps attracting keeps attracting keeps attracting at point it from two meters it's attracting still then then if you allow it to go beyond the point it from two meters then there is repulsion that is taking place just like the atoms the bond between the atoms so then there is an attraction there is attraction that is taking place between the two atoms but then when the electrons come too close too close then what happens is that there is repulsion that is taking place in the atoms. Uh, so something similar is happening at the nuclear level. So there is attraction and beyond 0.8 from 2 meters you want to reduce the distance, then the repulsion. So as, as there is repulsion, then the potential energy increases. And we get zero here and then you see it, it goes like that. So this is how the graph looks like. The potential energy, the nuclear force, Versus distance. So beyond just 2 femtometers, 1.5 2 femtometers, then it's almost zero. The force doesn't even exist. Nuclear force is zero for all practical purposes. So there is no potential energy beyond this. But then when you bring it closer, then the potential energy becomes more and more negative because this is attractive force. So you have to work against it, it will be negative. But then after 0.8 femtometer, when you push, closer then it's it stops being an attractive force it becomes a repulsive force it starts repelling then you have to do positive work so that is when go the, the, the graph rises here so this is how it looks like okay and there is no simple equation for this okay uh, if you take the coulomb force you have an equation a coulomb force equation there uh, if you have gravitational force you have uh, an equation there there is no such clear equation for a nuclear force. We have not found it yet. So that is that is that is what I want to tell you about. So the things that you need to remember is that the nuclear force is a very short range force. Beyond uh, the sh that short distance, it stops existing. It's it's almost it's zero. Okay, it's negligible. It's zero almost. Okay, so it doesn't even you don't even have to worry about it. So this is acting only in a very, very, very short distance. Okay. 
so that is why uh, okay neutron and neutron when you bring them together then they come back and then pro neutron proton they will come back then when you bring proton and proton the electrostatic force of repulsion is there between them but then when you bring them uh, when you bring these two uh, very close if the distance between them is like 1.5 femtometer or something then it starts acting an attractive force nuclear force becomes much stronger than the coulomb force of uh, repulsion so protons get attracted to each other at the small distance okay. all the other things will get attracted neutrons and neutrons will get attracted there's no surprise there and the neutron and proton can also get attracted there is no surprise there but you will also see proton and proton attracting each other at that small distance then then the nucleons come together so they get attracted attracted but then they reach a certain distance a smaller distance is pointed roughly pointed from to meter there if you bring it closer then they start repelling so it's both attractive and repulsive it's attractive over a small range and then starts repelling no uh, below that distance and it is non existence beyond that distance it doesn't exist here it's attractive here it is repulsive here in a small distance so that is how the nuclear force is i want you to understand let's talk about nuclear energy now uh, let me bring your attention uh, to the curve the, the the binding energy per nucleon versus the uh, uh, the atomic ma ma mass that graph okay. i'll draw it roughly it was like this right graph was something like this this was atomic uh, this is mass number that mass number along the x axis okay and then you have the, uh, binding energy per nucleon that's important that's per nucleon not the total binding energy so the the graph is something like this okay and you know it was like this and then it peaked here and then it started dropping here okay so we said this is these are the lighter nuclei and then you get heavier nuclei and then you said like over this distance it is roughly constant and after it started dropping okay roughly it comes so you said this is the saturation region this is where you know you get uh, the nucleons uh, combining with the maximum possible nucleons there so you can't have any more than the, the more connections i told you the, the nuclear force is short range force so if i am a nucleon i can get connected only with the nucleons nearby not with nucleons which are further away from me i can't do that okay so it is like that uh, so uh, that is why i get the saturation kind of the saturation here so this was the atomic uh, mass number was 30 here and between atomic mass number 170 and this was roughly flat so you you have uh, kind of you will reach the saturation for the binding energy per nucleon in this but if the atomic mass number was less than 30 or greater than 170 then there was a reduction in the binding energy per nucleon meaning that there were many nucleons which are not uh, exhausted the possibility of combining okay so so the other way of looking at it is this the greater the binding energy per nucleon the less uh mass seem to be like the, you know the more mass that you lose in the when 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 the nucleus is formed okay so that is what it is because there is saturation here okay, meaning that the greater the binding energy per nucleon you have lost more uh mass per nucleon that's why right that's why you get this so when you come here you are not lost uh, as much mass per nucleon that is why you have uh, this binding energy per nucleon less here binding energy per nucleon less means 
that you have more mass per nucleon. Sorry. And the same thing happens here and here. I told you that there are different two different reasons for it. Here, on the surface, you will have a lot of nucleons which have not been uh, which have not been bound with uh, the maximum possible nucleons, right? And here you have they can bind with a lot of nucleons, but then you don't have many nucleons around to bind. So that is why it is. So here the binding energy per nucleon is less, and here the binding energy per nucleon is also less. Okay, that is, which means that the mass per nucleon is more, and then the mass per nucleon is more here. Okay. So what happens is that if I if I can increase the binding energy per nucleon, then the mass of the nucleons will per nucleon will come down. Okay. So if we add a nucleon to this, then what happens is that combination, it is going to go and combine with the existing nucleons there, then each nucleon will lose a little more mass, then that will come out as energy. So here fusion will take place. So when I do fusion, that is when I convert a lighter nucleus into a heavier nucleus, then energy will be released. Energy will be released. This energy. Likewise, if this is where fission takes place, now it's a bigger nucleus. If you break them, if you break the nucleus, then it will occupy a smaller volume and then you'll have smaller surface area. And if you have smaller surface area, then you will have less number of uh, nucleons on the surface now. So more nucleons will get connected with uh, other nucleons. So when they get connected, they lose energy, then that energy will be released here. So fission takes place here. Energy will be released. So I'll say this is actually fission takes place. So you can think of it this way. Whether I go for fusion of lighter nuclei into heavier nuclei or the fission of heavier nuclei into lighter nuclei, then I will get energy. In this range, it is kind of stable. I can't do anything with it. Okay. Uh, not much can happen. But here, uh, heavier nuclei, when it becomes lighter nuclei, energy can be obtained. And here, the lighter nuclei, the become heavier nuclei, then, then also energy can be obtained because in this case, many will form the bond. So, whenever the bond is formed, a part of mass is going to be reduced. Here too, now you have a lot of uh, uh, nu nucleons on the surface which can bind with other nucleons but don't have nucleons to bind with. Now you break them into two parts, then they become smaller nuclei. Now you see, only a few can reside here. And some of them will combine with the other uh, nucleons there, thereby releasing energy. So this can happen. Okay? So this is how nuclear energy can be released. We know this. We know this by looking at the natural processes of radio, natural radioactivity, alpha, uh, uh, decay, beta decay and uh, the gamma decay. By looking at them, we know this. We know what is happening here. But now the question is, now that we know this, can we use it to our advantage? Uh, it is like you have a radioactive uh, element. Okay, you have a radioactive element. Because there is radioactivity is taking place because the nucleus is unstable. The nucleus has uh, more than it can handle. So it wants to become a smaller nucleus. So you know, then, the, then when smaller nucleus, when they become some smaller nucleus, uh, then more binding that is taking place there. So energy is going to be released, but that happens naturally. But now that you know this, can you use this knowledge to your advantage? Okay. So that is what we will see. Okay. Now, how can you use this knowledge to your advantage? Okay. Let's take a. I mean, if you have a radioactive uh, element, then it is automatically it's going to it, it, it's going to release energy. It's 
because the nucleus is unstable, it's going to release energy. But that is not going to be very useful to you. So what you should do is you should take a fairly stable nucleus. And whenever you want energy, then you need to make it unstable then. So you take a stable nucleus, make it unstable, then it releases energy. Okay, that is what you want, right? Okay. For example, if we have a gas cylinder, you don't you light it all the time. You, you, you keep it, you, you, you have it as fuel, and whenever you want, you light the gas. And whenever you don't want, you switch it off. So this is how you can handle this. Okay. So, in order to extract energy, the nuclear energy, what you should do is that you have to take a stable nucleus, make it unstable. And once you make it unstable, just like lighting a fire, make it unstable. The moment you make it unstable, then it catches fire, then it starts burning. Okay. So, the moment you make this nucleus unstable, then it starts releasing its energy, which you can harness, you can, you can use. Okay. So that is the idea. Okay. And that's the idea behind the nuclear reactors and all that. So here, uranium-236 is an unstable nucleus. Okay. Uranium, let's see, we'll talk about fission now. Okay. So uranium, 236, 92. So this is unstable. Okay. So what happens is this will this will start its radioactivity. It will release energy and all that. Okay. Uranium, it's naturally unstable, basically, uranium 236. But uranium 235 is stable. This is a stable nucleus, that's an unstable nucleus. So what you can do is you can take uranium 235, which is stable, because you don't want to, you know, uh, to, to be radioactive all the time. You don't want uranium 236 because it'll be radioactive. Whether you do anything or not, it'll be radioactive. You don't want that. You want it to be radioactive when you want it to be radioactive. Okay. So you have to use this uranium 235, convert that into uranium 236. Then the moment you convert that uranium 236, it has become unstable anyway. And once it becomes unstable, then it will release its energy. So this is how the, uh, uh, the atom bombs work. Okay? Because you have to carry the bomb, right? You have to carry, even if you're going to drop the bomb, you have to carry the bomb in hand. And you don't want it to explode. Okay? If you just carry uranium-236, then like it's, it's exploding as you're holding it. So you will also die. You don't want that to happen. Okay? So you keep it as uranium-235. And whenever you want, you make it uranium-236, then it releases energy, then it explodes. Okay, so that is what, that is the idea of it. So what happens is, you take uranium-235, let's say 92, this is 235, then I'm going to bombard this with a, a neutron. If I give a neutron, of course, I can't give a proton, then even 93, okay, you don't want that. Okay, uh, when you give a neutron, you go, like when you bombard it with the neutron, it goes and hits the nucleus, and the nucleus becomes unstable now. That's what it is. Okay, so it becomes plus neutron, which is zero, this is one, then that gives you uranium 92, but then you have 236. So this is important. So you're hitting the uranium 235 nucleus with neutron, neutron, then the neutron gets absorbed there, then that becomes uranium-236, the moment it becomes uranium-236, it becomes unstable. We said it. And if it becomes unstable, then it will start uh, disintegrating. It will become two smaller nuclei now, because it has to become stable, so it has to become smaller nuclei now. So this is the process. Okay, when it becomes too small, it becomes, when it becomes unstable, what happens is that it becomes two smaller nuclei. One is barium, which is 56, 
another one for a four, and the other one is Krypton, which is 36 and then 89, and plus you are going to get three neutrons. Okay. And we we'll also have energy coming out of it. What have you done here? You have taken a stable nucleus, uranium-235, you have bombarded that with a neutron, you have made it, it uranium-236, then this is unstable, because it is unstable, it becomes barium and krypton and three other neutrons. There are three neutrons coming out. So you have one neutron, you have, okay, it's like this. You have one, they are nucleus, you are hitting it with one neutron, okay, it's neutron, one neutron is hitting it. Then you have barium and krypton, then there are three neutrons coming out. Neutrons, neutron, neutron, coming out of this. Okay, so barium and krypton, with energy, when energy is also released, then, yeah. And what happens, this neutron will go hit another nucleus, uranium nucleus, let's say this is uranium, uranium, this will go hit another uranium, this will go hit another uranium, you see now, again three are going to be released here, okay, so neutron, 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 then again neutron, 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 then neutron, 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 then they will hit, you know, the next other nucleus, okay, uranium, uranium, Now what happens? Now they will have three here, they will have three here, they have three here, three, three neutrons, three neutrons, three neutrons, three, three. You notice one neutron now has become so many neutrons here. So when you are hitting one uh, nucleus, there is a certain amount of energy. Now you get more energy. Now you get even more energy. So you see there is a chain reaction. There is a chain reaction. And with each stage, the energy that is getting released is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And that is why you see the mushroom when a nuclear explosion takes place. It's a lot of energy. It starts from small and then when suddenly all these neutrons will go collide with something and get a big uh, energy, a, a large amount of energy which is coming out of the the maturity. Okay, so this is called the chain reaction. This is chain reaction. This is uncontrolled, right? Because once you start the process, you have no control over it. Okay, it goes and 1 becomes 3, and then 3 becomes 9, 9 becomes 27, 27 becomes 81. So all these neutrons will keep hitting. It becomes uncontrolled. It's a bomb, it's a nuclear bomb. But when you can control this, what you're going to control the control chain reaction is something like this, okay? You get this. Uranium, neutron hits here, and there are three coming out. Then what you do, you suck up these two. No, you suck up these two. Then you are left with only one. Now that is, is you. Okay. Now again, you three come out. Then you suck up these two. Then there is one. Then you go hit another one. Then three, then suck up these two. No, you see, notice here one neutron, one nucleus, one neutron, one nucleus, one neutron, one nucleus. You see now it's a controlled reaction. It is uncontrolled. It is mushrooming. Okay, it's becoming from a very small number to a big number. But here it is not so. You suck up the excess neutrons, and then only one neutron is allowed for the most part. And they go hit here, hit here, hit here. You see, then certain amount of energy is coming out, same amount of energy is coming out, same amount of energy is coming out, same amount of energy is coming out in each of them. But here, the energy is being big, it's an explosion that is taking place. But there, it is, it's highly controlled. It's like drawing a certain amount of energy. Okay, give me so many million, uh, electron volt. This, uh, not mega electron volt, mega electron, one mega electron, hundred mega electron volt. So, you just keep getting a certain amount of energy from each uh, nucleus. So this is this is uncontrolled, 
un controlled chain reaction this is controlled chain reaction okay this is a bomb so when you have an atomic bomb this is what is happening this is simply the nuclear reactor The nuclear reactor you have in Kalpakam and other places, they use this method. Okay? The excess neutrons will be absorbed. So you can control how many neutrons will be present at any point in time. So you can, uh, you, you can maintain it. For example, you can allow, you can sort with one neutron and once they have reached this level, then any further increase can be sucked up. So you see, this amount of energy can be constantly obtained from that point forward. We allow this uncontrolled chain reaction to happen for, for a very small amount of time so that you see a certain amount of energy is coming out. The moment that energy is coming out, then you start sucking up the excess electrons. So from this point forward, you see, then you can get this. Okay? And this will also get this. And this will also get this. So from then on, you know, only so many atoms, nuclei, will be undergoing uh, this radioactivity. Only so many uh, nuclei will be bombarded. From then on, you will get constant amount of energy. So this is uncontrolled chain reaction. This is controlled chain reaction. This is what the bomb is and this is what the nuclear reactor is. But the process is the same. So when does a, you know, a, a, a nuclear reactor explode? When does it explode? like it happened in Chernobyl in Russia long ago in the 80s. When this fails, when you fail to suck up the excess neutrons, then you are you're going to end up like this. So when the control rods in the nuclear reactor fail, then this is what will happen. Then it becomes a bomb. Okay. When the control rods in the nuclear reactor work, when it's maintained, then it starts giving you energy. So it's like the gas cylinder. Only when you take the required amount, then you can use it for, uh, you know, for your purposes. But when you cannot control the gas cylinder, then it explodes, then all of us die in the house. So it's like that. Okay? Uh, so it's like the fire accident that takes place, the gas cylinder bursting. And the same thing happens with the nuclear reactor. But you can, you can control it. This can give you a lot of energy. Okay. So this is what it is. So this is the final stop. Okay. The end state is this. But sometimes what happens is that the same reaction can result in intermediate states. And those intermediate states will finally come, come to this state. Okay. So I will tell you two such things now. One is this. The same thing. Uh, the same the neutron, you have uranium-235, stable nucleus, and then you are bombarding it with one neutron, then it becomes uranium-236, now it has, becomes, it has become unstable, so it will aut automatically, on its own, undergo the decay, okay. disintegration will take place, and this can kill this would be 51 and then 133 plus and be 41 99 plus 4 neutron. So then again you have energy. Because when it becomes smaller, then more mass will be lost, so that mass will be converted into energy. So this is what's happening. So this is one stage, intermediate stage. Another stage could be something like this. Same, uranium 92, then 235, then plus same, you go 1, then it becomes uranium 92, 236. It can become unstable, and then it can give you xenon 54. 140 plus 
fraction 38 94 plus 2 newtons extra newtons energy will come out of it okay but these are intermediate stages. Okay. And then what happens is these nuclei themselves are uh, unstable. This is stable. You know, this stable condition. This is stable, this is also stable. The final part. Here, if if any of uh, these two equations take place, then this is unstable, this is also unstable, this is also unstable, this is also unstable. So, because they are unstable, what will happen is that they start uh, undergoing beta decay. Okay, they will undergo beta decay. Because they are unstable, all these four um, products, all these four nuclei are unstable. So, they will undergo beta decay. This is unstable, all right? And it goes from this unstable condition to these unstable conditions and these unstable conditions, they have to become stable, right? So they, what they will do, all these things will undergo beta decay and by doing the beta decay, you know, they can become this. Come back to this one. This is a final stable position. This intermediate thing will finally become the stable nuclei of uh, um, barium and krypton. So urine, once you have done this, Uranium can take either this path or this path and finally become that. Okay. So, anything is possible. But the final product is this. These are intermediate products. Okay. Because they themselves are unstable. They will undergo beta D, as I said. Okay. Uh, so, the energy that is released from this uh, will be uh, in the form of the kinetic energy of these. The, these products, right? So, you know, they, they'll start moving. Okay, barium krypton won't stay there. Uh, they'll start moving. Okay. Uh, and that kinetic energy will finally get converted to heat because they go hit uh, other, other things, water. So, then they can heat the water. Uh, then that heat energy can be used for uh, other purposes, you can see. So, that is, that's what it is. Okay. So, first, this energy comes out of it as the kinetic energy of the products and the kinetic energy of the products will finally become heat energy. It's like this, if I drop this and it goes and hits here, okay, the kinetic energy has now become heat energy. So these products when they go collide with something else then heat is produced. So whatever energy, the kinetic energy they have will become heat energy. Okay, so that's the final. So you get heat energy. Once you get heat, you can convert it into anything that you want. Okay. Electrical energy or any energy. You can very easily have that. I hope this is clear to you. Now let's put a number uh, to the amount of energy that is released. Okay. Uh, let me just, uh, it's, it's roughly 200 mega electron volt. So the amount of energy released is 200 mega electron volt per nucleus. So you, you take one atom of uranium into this world, like the amount of energy that is released because of that, uh, uh, the nuclear fission uh, you have resulted is about 200 mega electron volt okay, for each atom, each nucleus. Okay, then how do we even arrive at it? It's like this. Well, well let's take a, a typical 240 nucleon atom. Okay, so it's 240. So mass number, let's say, is 240 now. So for this mass number, if you remember, the binding energy per nucleon, binding energy per nucleon from the graph was about uh, 7.6 mega electron volt. Okay, because drooping, another So after this, for 240, it was about 7.6 mega electron volt. Suppose this breaks into two uh, nuclei, each with uh, you know mass number 120, let's say, roughly. Okay. So you have uh, A1, that is 120, and then A2, that is 120. Okay. Let's see, let's see, just for the sake of the argument. So 240 mass number has become 120 and 120 here. 
Okay, but if you see uh, for the 120 from the graph, the binding energy per nucleon was 8.5 mega electron volt. It's 8.5 mega electron volt. Okay. So what has happened? Actually, it has become less massive. Why? Right? Because 240 had certain mass. Now we're talking 120. So you have when it becomes from two 120s, and there will be more binding that will take place. As more binding that takes place, more mass will be lost. And as more mass is lost, the more energy will be released. So that energy divided by the number of nuclei will give you the binding energy per nuclei, which is 8.5. 8.5, 7.5. .5. So then what is the gain in the binding energy here? So the gain in the binding energy okay, is equal to 8.5 minus 7.6, which is equal to 0.9 mega electron volt per nucleon. Right? So per nucleon, you are gaining an energy of 0.9 mega electron, almost 1 mega electron volt is what you get. Okay. So if the nucleus has 240 nucleons, here, right? 120, 140. So for the 240 nucleons, so if A is equal to 240. A is 240, that's what you start with, and each nucleon is going to give you 0.9 mega electron volt. So the total energy you get, the energy that you get is going to be equal to roughly 240, the number of nucleons there, into the energy gain per nucleon, which is 0.9 mega electron volt, and this is going to be roughly it's 216 mega electron volt. So when one 240 nucleus Fissure, fissions into uh, two 120 nuclei, then you are going to get 216 mega electron volt energy. So each nucleus will give you 216 mega electron volts. And in the case of uranium, uh, we say it is roughly uh, 200 mega electron volt because it doesn't have 240 and doesn't. Okay, so it's like that. Roughly each uranium nucleus will give you roughly 200 mega electron volt energy. So, hope uh, it's clear to you. Uh, if you if you have uh, one kg of uranium nucleus, imagine the amount of uh, energy that will come out of it. Okay. So, one one nucleus you get this, and for one kg, then we need to find out how many. Uh, uranium nuclei are there and each nucleus will give you 200. So when you use 1 kg of uranium, uranium 236 or uh, 235 converted to 236 okay. so imagine the amount of energy that will come out of it. Hope this is clear to you. Okay now let's talk about fusion. I said fusion is a process of uh, bringing two smaller, uh, two, two lighter nuclei uh, to form a heavier uh, nucleus. Okay, so that is that is fusion. Uh, so this is a process uh, that is taking place in the sun, and this is what is giving us light and energy. Uh, uh, if this so, the sun is a is a is a nuclear reactor. So probably the giant nuclear reactor that you can ever see uh, properly. Okay. And of course, all stars are nuclear reactors. Uh, there are much more massive stars than the sun uh, in the universe, in our own galaxy. Our sun is an average star, you know that. There are much more uh, massive stars around. Uh, but the, the, the point is that uh, nuclear fusion is the reason the stars exist. Okay? Uh, so they convert lighter elements, which are abundant in nature, okay? lighter elements into oh, heavier elements. So basically, like everything, the sun is actually a hydrogen bomb. Okay, I can't say that. So the hydrogen bomb is uh, is a bomb, okay, which uses the uh, the principle of uh, nuclear fusion. So this is what happens. Let's start with hydrogen. Let's see what happens when two hydrogen uh, nuclei combine. 
hydrogen nuclei are nothing but protons, right? So we'll start with that, okay? So you take two protons, and when they combine, then let's see what happens. So that is 1 H1, 1 H1 plus, again, this H1. They combine to form 1 H2, which is the, the deuterium nucleus, okay? Plus, there is emission of positron. Plus, obviously, when there is an emission, there will also be a, a neutron. And this process gives you 0.42 mega electron volt. 0.42 mega electron volt energy. So, two protons combine to form one neutron nucleus and it emits positron. Okay. You can make that. Okay. What is this positron? Actually, this is one zero, right? So, one plus one, one plus one, two. That's what it is. Yeah, you understand. So, the charge is balanced, the mass is also balanced. That's what it is. Next, what happens is that this neutron nucleus, 1H2, combines with another neutron nucleus. I mean, they should take place twice to create two of them, right? <coughs> one reaction for this and one reaction for this. Okay, so two reactions would happen. And they give you this time helium, but the isotope of helium, which is 2, actually 3, not 4. So the isotope of helium is plus a neutron. And this process gives you 3.27 mega electron volt of energy. Okay, this can happen. And what can happen is, the other thing that happens is that these two deuterium nuclei can combine to give you a tritium nuclei, right? Okay, one, three, and plus this will be one H1. Okay, one proton can come out of it. Two deuterium, uh, deuterium nuclei can combine to give you one tritium nuclei and then one proton and plus 4.0. 3 mega electron volt energy. So, this is the amount of energy which is coming out in each of these reactions. You can see that, uh, uh, that two protons can come together to effect this. But notice this how can two protons come together? Uh, they are going to repel each other, right? Suppose there are two protons here, then how can they come together first? We estimate that there must be uh, an energy of 400 kilo electron volt for each proton, the kinetic energy, but they, they must have some speed to come together, okay? they, they, when they approach, they must have some speed, right? So they, if the speed is not great, then what happens is that they come, then they repel, then they come to a stop, and then they go back in different directions. So they won't come and fuse. So for them to come to that small distance to fuse, they must have enough energy, right? They must have, they must come really fast, uh, so that they come to a longer, to, to, to closer distance, basically. Okay? If there's, I'm just saying this, the 10 meter per second, then there is repulsion, then you go ahead. 20 meter per second, then come closer. 30 meter per second, come even closer. Okay, okay. so, so uh, there would be some speed. Okay, some kinetic energy. If there is a speed, there is a kinetic energy. So there must be some kinetic energy at which they will come close enough for the nuclear force to overtake. Then they fuse. Okay. So that energy is estimated to be about 400 kilo electron volts. If each proton has this energy or more, then they can come and fuse come to a close enough distance so that the nuclear force can take over uh, and uh, the Coulomb force of repulsion becomes you know, uh, negligible. So, it is, so they have to go really fast. So only high energy protons can participate in fusion. Okay. Uh, this is estimated, like if you remember, if something is moving with a certain velocity, 
then it will have a you know you can have a, a temperature equivalent if you remember the from 11 standard if there are particles which are moving with a certain velocity kind of that's a then you can uh, we said that temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of uh, the particles if you remember from 11 standard temperature is usually that can be used as the measure of average kinetic energy of the particles uh, we even say this a thermometer is the speedometer for atoms okay. so when you keep it a thermometer and uh, it reads some value it tells you on the average how fast the atoms in your uh, uh, your mouth are moving okay so the thermometer is the speedometer for atoms similar like okay so this 400 kilo electron volt energy if it convert if if a proton has to have this amount of energy then what should be the temperature then the temperature okay you can use that expression 3 by 2 k uh, t okay remember that's the energy right so that must be equal to 400 kilo electron volts kilo electron volts then if you do the this is from the level sign remember the kinetic theory of gases less so then if you calculate the temperature from this the temperature is given to be 3 into 10 power 9 kelvin 3 into 10 power 9 kelvin okay very high temperature but certainly um, the temperature on the surface of the earth or even the, uh, the core of the, uh, the surface of the sun or in the core of the sun it doesn't have this amount of uh, temperature it is it is much less than this but then you say you know the temperature is average it's a measure of average kinetic energy okay. so there will be a few uh, protons or hydrogen atoms uh, which will be traveling faster than this and there will be some to be traveling less than this so what we know is that only the hydrogen atoms which uh, which have this this energy they take place in fusion so not all hydrogen in the sun take place uh, in fusion if they do then the sun will blow up in a second immediately because if all of them take part in the, in the reaction then they will blow up in a second but the sun is there the sun has been there for nearly 5 billion years now okay which means that not all hydrogen uh, is taking part in this a uh, nuclear fusion that is taking place in the sun okay so only the hydrogen atoms which are which have this energy are taking part in it okay but you know the temperature is the average kinetic energy the average kinetic energy of the hydrogen atoms is this but there will be some hydrogen atoms which have more than average kinetic energy uh, and some hydrogen atoms which will have at least this amount of uh, kinetic energy only they take part in fusion so not all hydrogen atoms in the sun are taking part in nuclear fusion okay you need to understand that first okay so this is so you need a minimum of 400 kilo electron volt uh, for the protons uh, to come together and get fused with each other okay? so that's you need to understand this and you also need to understand that not all hydrogen atoms in the sun have that energy because the average energy of the sun the average temperature of the sun suggests that the average energy is much less than 400 kilo electron volt okay so the sun doesn't have this temperature so which means that this is not the average kinetic energy this is average kinetic energy sun will blow up in no time okay so this doesn't happen here you need to understand it. this is the temperature for all of uh, uh, protons all hydrogen atoms to take part in nuclear fusion okay so okay so having said that let's uh, talk about uh, the uh, the uh, nuclear reaction that is taking place in the sun so you know that two hydrogen atoms can come together uh, to form this kind of a uh, of nuclear fusion
So what happens in the sun is this. First, this happens. So one proton plus one more proton, they come together to form a deuterium nucleus. In the process, there is an emission of positron, okay, beta plus decay. Okay. Uh, plus, obviously, wherever there you have this, you will have a neutron here. Okay. And with the energy of 0 0.42 mega electron volt. This takes place. The second is that this positron, this positron, the least positron, will combine with an existing electron. Okay, each atom will have electron, right? Hydrogen will have an electron. So the released positron will combine with electron. I told you, these are, uh, these are matter antimatter combination. Electron and positron are matter antimatter combination. So they definitely they annihilate each other, they will kill each other and they will vanish as gamma rays. Energy will be released, that's what I said. So the next part is this E plus will combine with E minus electron, positron combined with electron to give you the gamma radiation. I say, okay, I'll go plus 1.02 mega electron volt. Why do we have two gamma? It's because you see momentum, the law of conservation of momentum has to be obey. For example, if I have an electron, okay, if I have an electron here, electron coming here, minus this way, and then the positron coming here, this way. You see, then there is a, a certain momentum there. Okay? And once they combine, then what happens is, gamma ray travels in this direction. You see, the, the, the momentum of this must match with the momentum of this. Okay? Uh, you know that from your uh, uh, dual nature uh, lesson that there is a momentum to light, okay, gamma ray, uh, any electromagnetic radiation. So this momentum will have to maintain. That is why you say this gamma, and this gamma. There are two gammas here, not just one gamma. Okay, one point. Then the energy in that process is one point zero two mega electron volt. Understand this? Positron and electron combine. They are matter antimatter pair, they annihilate each other, they destroy each other, and then they produce energy which goes as gamma rays. Okay, that's it. And there are two gammas because law of conservation of momentum. That's what. Um, next, what happens is uh, this one, uh, this deuterium, deuterium combines with another proton, another proton, and it gives you. So helium to you know this okay, plus this gamma okay, plus 5.49 mega okay. electron. So what is this gamma? This gamma is the actual TK. Okay, like you when you know you uh, you form this then, okay, uh, these two things come together to form this helium nucleus, but it is an excited state, so it has to come to the ground state. When it comes to the ground state, this gamma radiation uh, takes place. Then the amount of energy in the process is 5.49 mega electron volt. That amount of energy is released. So now you have this. So for up till here, how much is the energy released? 0.4 to here, 1.0 to there. And then 5.498. So if you sum it all up, then what's energy I get for this? This would be 4, 13, 1, 9, and then this is 6, 6.93 mega electron volts. So you start from here, you reach here, and then you get totally 6.93 mega electron volt. This is one process. Okay. Then Then what happens next? That is important. <clears throat> you get one more. So the next is, I've got helium 3, 
helium 3 I got. Now I am going to get one more helium. So for this process to take place, this should have taken place twice. If it happens once, one helium is produced, helium 3. So if it happens twice, then two helium 3 are produced. Okay, so this, when once two helium uh, 3 is there, then they combine to produce helium, your regular helium, helium 4. Okay, and this plus 1 H1 plus 1 H2, there are two hydrogen nuclei. They create, so they, they combine, they produce one helium and then two hydrogen here again. Plus, in this process, it releases an energy of 12.86 mega electron volt. Okay. So, this process gives you 12.86 mega electron volt. So, totally, we start from here for you to get, to get to this helium. Hydrogen getting converted into helium. So, hydrogen, 1H1, getting converted into 2HE4. So what's the amount of energy that is released in this process? Hydrogen getting converted into this. Lots of hydrogens will be How many hydrogens are taken by the four hydrogens? Notice. One, two, three, four. Four hydrogen coming together to form one helium. And what's the amount of energy that you have uh, got? Well, if it takes place once, to produce one that is 6.93 and then for this it should have released 6.93 mega electron volt and they two combine to produce this 12.86 mega electron volt so this is MeV and this MeV MeV so totally what you get is a so it's a 26.7 so 26.7 Mega electron volt is what is given. Add them up to it. So, when four hydrogen electrons combine to produce one helium, uh, four hydrogen nuclei combine to produce one helium nuclei, nucleus and two hydrogen nucleus again. That will happen in the process. But, but mainly, four of the initial nuclei are four, then they should do this. In the process, you get an energy of 26.7 mega electron volt. And this is how higher elements are fused. Uh, so, from simple hydrogen, you get you know, a little more complex helium. And then what happens later is that, you know, like once it has, the sun has used up all the hydrogen, let us suppose it has used up all the hydrogen. Uh, then what happens then is that it starts, it, 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 it starts cooling. So the, the you know the temperature of the sun comes down as it comes as it comes down, then um, the gravity takes over because you have helium, right? It's a little more. So the, then the size of the sun comes down. So gravity takes over. Then they come and they collide with each other. That's a, this crushing that is taking place because it has used up all the hydrogen. So it loses. Uh, you know, you know the, the the temperature comes down. So the the sun becomes smaller, it collides. As it collides, then this gravitational energy becomes heat energy. And because it becomes heat energy, then the fusion of helium takes place. Heliums combine to produce carbon. Okay, and then carbon will combine to produce something else. Okay? The process continues uh, till you know you can you, you create um, um, iron. Okay, so. You see, all these elements that you see in nature have been, have been forged in the furnace of a star. Okay? So look at yourself. You have iron there, you have carbon there, you have many other elements there inside. All these things have been forged inside a dying star. And then it becomes a neutron star, and then something else takes place, and other heavier elements are, are, uh, are produced. So, like, uh, everything that you see in the uh, in nature, uh, where forged 
in, in the crucible of stars. When the star died, when stars died, then these things were produced. So uh, the hydrogen, the, the, the iron you see, the phosphorus you see, okay, and, and the carbon you see in your body, they were all once in a star. Then the star exploded, then spewing all these things into space, and then they come together and formed Earth and you know other planets, and from there you 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 came to be. So every every atom in your body has come from a star. You are made of star stuff. Yeah, that's fascinating. You see where we started and, and what kind of story we have, uh, you know, we have come to, what we have figured out, it's amazing. We just started with protons, neutrons and nucleus and stuff and suddenly we realize that we or the atoms in our bodies were once inside stars. Hope this blows your mind.